Okay, looks like the recorded, recording has started. Um, as I mentioned in my email, the webinar will be recorded, um, and then I will post this recording on our um, support service uh, web page and send that out to, to everyone once, uh, once it's posted. So welcome, uh, this is the uh, overview for new grantees, kind of welcome webinar for our support service uh, grantees for state fiscal year 2425. So I'm glad uh, so many of you could join today uh, during the webinar. For those of you who are listening to the recording, I'm glad you're able to uh, get the information that way. So just a quick overview of the webinar, um, starting with the welcome. Um, a grant overview of the support service grant, uh, overview of financial expectations and requirements, um, a little overview of Workforce One, which kind of relates to the reporting requirements, which we'll talk about, uh, sort of an overview of technical assistance, and then I'll leave time at the end for Q&As. And as I said in the email, I, I don't believe it will take the full hour for our, the presentation, so lots of times for questions and answers. Um, and then, um, like I said, well, uh, post this once it's um, once the recording saved and, and communications can get it posted. So to start with, I guess a, a welcome to all of you and then an introduction to myself. I'm, my name is Kathy Young. I'm a program coordinator here at DEED and my email is there on the screen, probably an email you already have, uh, but wanted to have it um, right here at the, the start of the webinar. Um, the webinar, like I said, will be recorded. Um, I know probably several of your colleagues can't join today. For those who are uh, listening, uh, we wanted to make this recording available uh, for for anyone to go back and review as needed. I'll post the slides uh. as well. And then, yeah, just a few housekeeping pieces. If you want to use the chat uh, feature, if you have a question, feel free to do that, the raise hand feature. Um, do that if whatever kind of uh, suits you best. I'll try to pause between the sections to kind of cover questions. We don't need to wait till the end to go over all of them. Um, so definitely jump in when you do have questions. And then, of course, if you have questions following the webinar, for those of you watching the recording, um, best to yeah email me with, with any of those questions. So yeah, a little uh, Overview will start kind of at the top with an overview of DEED, especially for those of you who are um, partnering with, with DEED for the, for, you know, for the first time or, or um, haven't had previous grants with, um, oops, jumped ahead, with DEED. Uh, yeah, the mission of DEED is to empower the growth of the Minnesota economy for everyone. And um, as part of that mission, the uh, legislature, you know, appropriated the funds for the support service grant uh, to DEED to have um, us run the competitive grant program, uh, the, the support service, youth support service grant program. So that, uh, as you are all familiar with, was uh, done through a competitive um, process and was quite competitive this year. So we have 12 grantees um, that, yeah, you'd be uh, staff from one of those grantees and um, that comprises our support service program for this biennium, the State Fiscal 24-25. And then just a little behind the scenes with Indeed, the program is um, managed through our Office of Youth Development, which I am um, one of the staff members. Um, some of you may be familiar with our Youth at Work program. It's much larger, uh, and that is also managed through Office of Youth Development. Some similarities, some um, some differences. So, if that program, if you're familiar with that program or have um, had grants through that program, some of this information may be familiar. Um, some will be uh, slightly slightly different as it is. A different um, funding stream. So to start with the basics, the eligible population uh, for the support service uh, is to provide grants to organizations that provide support services to individuals. Um, those individuals must be uh, individuals from low-income communities and or adults ages 14, young adults ages 14 to 24 with a um, or from families with history of intergenerational poverty and or individuals from communities of color. And this is language laid out um, in the appropriation. <clears throat> we do call our team offices development, but the majority of our programs are serving what I would um, call more young adults, that 14 to 24 um, age range. 
And then the eligible services, this is the services that um, are allowable under this grant. Um, are There's seven of them, again, laid out in the appropriation, and that's job training, employment preparation, internships, job assistance to parents, financial literacy, and then academic and behavioral inter interventions for low performing students and or youth intervention activities. So in terms of all of your um, proposals and then of course the grant contracts that are put in place, I don't think anyone is doing all seven, uh, any uh, program, but definitely um, the services that are um, offered through this program you know, should fall under one of these seven. I know most of you are, are doing, uh, I would say, a handful of these, uh, particularly those top three or four are, are probably the most common within this program. So I've gotten a couple of questions about funding and just kind of the grant cycle. Um, I think I wanted to make sure to go over that, especially for those that are um, new to, to having a competitive grant uh, under uh, DEED. The award for support service uh, is for state fiscal 24 and 25. So the contracts that we just worked um, with all of you to get in place is your state fiscal year 24 contract, which started July 1st, um, unless otherwise noted. And for most of your grants, that is July 1st, a few um, that were paperwork came back later, have a later start date. Um, but I think that's only one grantee. Um, I, I, I made sure to highlight that in, a, um, in the grant paperwork that was sent out. So that's basically uh, the first year that current contract is running from the start of state fiscal year July 1st through June 30th um, of state fiscal year or of 24, which is the end of state fiscal year 24. Um, and that's that first year of the award. The second year of the award, which would be state fiscal year 25, will be available July 1st uh, of 2024, so next July. So it's a competitive grant that we only do every uh, two years. Uh, so that grant that you applied for and then were awarded is a two year grant, but we're only able to basically encumber funds one year at a time. So next spring, um, I'll send out an email and, and remind everyone to submit updated work plan and budget. It would be a very similar contracting process to what we did um, this August, September. We'll be able to start it a much earlier next spring because it won't be the first year of the biennium. So by the end of June, um, hopefully much sooner, we'll have all of your state fiscal year 25 contracts in place, um, which means that you'd be able to start basically tapping the state fiscal year 25 funds starting July 1st for your um, for your second year of your award. <clears throat> Maybe we'll just pause there. Oh, it looks like we do have a question. Uh, yeah, Stephanie, if you want to just come off mute if that's easiest. Yeah. So just quickly, so I understand second year funds aren't available until 7124. But what if we had funds that still were remaining on 63024? Do those roll forward or do we need to make sure we spend those? That's a great question. Um, right now all of your contracts contracts are set to end June 30th. Um, we will check in probably in the spring as well, if there's any extension needed. And so if we don't do an extension, then June 30th would be the last day for a state fiscal year 24, um, but we'll extend usually one quarter to September is kind of the, the standard. I have a couple of grants that just ended from our last um, biennium just here at the end of September. So that would be something if you're expecting to need an extension, I would just say reach out early on that we wouldn't really do the paperwork probably till late winter early spring but if you if we don't do that extension then it would be june 30th yeah that, that's helpful thank you so much yeah of course any other questions i guess where we're on kind of that uh, funding timeline and it would be the same looking ahead you know a two years almost on um, that second year funding ideally everyone's fully expended by June 30th, but if that's, if you know you're running into um, something where that's not going to be the case, uh, we can do that extension on the second year funds. I would say in general, spend down that first year funding. So if you do have unspent 2024 20, funds, we'd want you to that request that extension and spend down those funds before you start spending those 
state fiscal year 25 funds because um, those state fiscal year 25 funds would be available you know and uh, longer i'm not seeing any other questions uh, i'll move on for the next section is the financial expectations kind of really looking at uh, the yeah requirements on uh, yeah, the, the financial expectations, and we'll kind of cover the RPR. I've had several questions about that come in um, as these grants get underway. So kind of zooming out, you know, even beyond specifics of this grant, just general cost guidance, which I hope um, most of you are aware of, or your fiscal team is uh, very aware of. Um, and that would be that costs, you know, must follow um, the following um, the following uh, items that they must be appropriately allocated, consistently applied necessary, reasonable, um, allocable, and then incurred within the time period of the grant. So that last bullet is kind of what we we had uh, just covered in the previous slide. So, um, you know, no funds could be cut, no funds um, for activities could be um, spent on activities like before July 1st this year, for example. Um, and then if you, I guess if you have questions on any of the uh, other pieces, definitely reach out. Um, that would be uh, something that for this grant in general, it would be spending funds that are tied to your work plan and budget, um, you know, consistently applied. If there is something that you're providing to participants that that's applied consistently, um, appropriately allocated. We see that come up particularly with the administrative funds. Um, I'll go over kind of what's allowable under that category, but if this grant is, you know, a certain percentage of your overall, um, you know, portfolio of programs, having funds for this grant um, allocated appropriately for things like for overhead costs. Um, so in terms of taking a closer look at what are the, the cost categories for this grant and what's allowable under um, each, uh, administrative costs um, are costs that um, are kind of for your overall um, administration of the program. They are limited to 10% of the award amount, um, and that's um, kind of like I put in bold there. 10% is based on total expenditures. So obviously we'd want everyone to fully expend, and then you doing so you could spend up to 10% on admin. If you do run into a case where you're not fully expending that grant, it would be 10% of the funds you did expend. Um, doesn't come up that often because most people do fully expend, um, but just something to be um, aware of uh, from, from the beginning. And then administrative costs would be ones associated with the functions not related to the direct provision of services um, to program participants. I think I have like some examples here. So, you know, your back end accounting, personnel management functions, payroll functions, um, cost of administrative functions. Um, systems and procedures required um, to carry out the above administrative functions um, for monitoring or oversight. And there's a few more examples in our um, cost category, uh, budget cost category definitions. Um, and that is something uh, we included in the RFP. Uh, I will, if it's not already, I believe it's posted on our website, but I can, um, I don't think there's been any changes since last year, but I'll double check. But that's um, something we do have posted we'll get questions on throughout the year, a good resource to refer to, or um, if you have questions around, you know, would this count under, you know, a certain cost category. Uh, direct service to participants is the next cost category, and I would say looking overall at budget, this is the probably uh, largest category uh, in terms of where funds have been um, allocated, you know, across your, across your programs. And Direct service to participants would be costs associated with providing direct services to participants um, and included in this cost would be um, any staff wages and fringe for staff providing direct services. So um, often a, a, you know, a job coach or individual doing, you know, individual career planning with a participant, that case management um, of participants, uh, assessment of the skills, uh, needed for what services you're going to provide, development of individual service plans, career planning, mentoring, uh, kind of most of those um, uh, examples are, as you can tell, are kind of that working one-on-one -on -one or um, in small groups with participants. Um, and then it wouldn't 
like I said, a lot of that then it breaks down to be covering the wages and fringe for the staff providing those services. A direct customer training. Um, I know some of your programs have this uh, as a more significant um, cost category than others. Um, and that would be any tuition, books, fees, on the job training reimbursement, participant wages and fringe, um, and that are provided directly to the customer on the customer's behalf. Um, and so that's kind of what would fall under direct customer training, um, particularly that participant wages and fringe um, could uh, could be a significant portion of your budget, um, depending on you know, your program model uh, and, and work plan. I mean, it wouldn't uh, include staff costs we don't include the staff costs in this category um, unless staff are providing that direct customer training. So most of that direct service to participant staff wages and friends should be in that previous category. And then support service, which is its own budget category. I know we do get questions on this because it's a bit of a double use of the term, I would say, because our grant is use support services. Uh, in terms of the overall title of the, the, the grant program, but then one of the cost categories is support services. And in that case, the, in terms of the cost category for support services, it is referring to services or items um, that you're covering for participants um, that are necessary for their participation in the program. Um, and that would be specifically your support service program. And that could be transportation, housing, childcare assistance, travel, um, personal technology, clothing, tools. If you have questions on if something's allowable, definitely reach out. Um, and it, in this case, the support service um, could be paid directly to the participant or to a third party vendor. And I think that's, um, yeah, that's the final cost category. Maybe I'll pause there to see if there's any questions. I think the budget also includes other. I don't think very many of the work plans included in other category, but it is if something isn't falling under one of those um, reach out the other cost category um, is in the budget I don't I can't remember if anyone offhand has that um, in their approved budget but um, something we can talk about if that comes up for you yeah another question uh, I guess from Stephanie I'm just full of questions today so no I, I it's helpful your question might be one somebody else has um, so curious about different different funders have different rules around flexibility between grant categories. So let's say we end up spending more on youth wages than we anticipated and less on support services, for instance. Does that need a, a formal revision? Is there a percentage in between that we can make changes? Yeah, if we could talk about that a little bit. That, that's a great question. Perfect time timing too. Um, you would need a modification to the budget if you're we can only basically we can only approve um, payments that are within in line with your approved budget. So if there is a cost category where you've expended the approved budget for that cost, but you anticipate having more expenditures in that cost category, that would need a formal budget, um, a formal contract modification. We might not need to revise the work plan, um, but we would need to revise that budget and shift the funds from whatever cost category you're expending less in to that cost category. The one exception is for the final RPR, and I know we're a ways off from that, but something to keep in mind, the final RPR of the grant, and that would be for your state fiscal year 24 grant, um, that one can differ from the approved budget. Uh, there's, not a, there's not a set percentage that it can differ, but it, it, it can't be a, if there's, a, yeah, there's not a set percentage, but it, um, if it's a significant shift, my guess is that would probably be a shift that would need a modification to the work plan. Maybe something's really changing about your program model. I, I rarely see that. It's usually just the final RPR is things are shifting a bit to just be able to expend the final funds that are you know, different than that approved budget. Um, again, that would just be your final RPR for the year. So at this point, if you're looking ahead and you're already thinking, I think we're going to be expending differently, my guess is you'll need a modification since we're a ways off from the end of the year. Okay, helpful. Thank you. Yeah. And then I guess kind of related to that, um, 
if you're able to expend the state fiscal year 24 following your approved budget, but you're, you know, looking ahead and you're like, oh, next year I think we want to do it different, you could, you'd be submitting, everyone would be submitting a state fiscal year 25 budget, and that can differ from your state fiscal year 24 budget in terms of the how you're allocating your budget breakdown between the cost categories. Great, that's super helpful, thank you. Any other questions before we kind of shift to talking a little bit more about the RPRs? So I know some grants, um, grantees, you've already submitted your first um, RPR. Uh, I guess I should, yeah, the reimbursement, um, request for reimbursement. And that's the um, just usual method of payment um, for deed grants is through reimbursement on actual expenditures incurred. Um, I think there are a few grantees that are on FSR. Um, I'll kind of use the terms interchangeably. I think the information here is related to both. Um, but this would be the Excel template that was um, sent out along with your executed contract uh, and is the, um, yeah, the RPR, the reimbursement template for uh, your support service grant. Uh, all documentation for reimbursement should be retained um, and then be available, you know, uh, upon request. There are some grants, some of your grants did have a special term and condition. It would be, I think it's number six on your terms and conditions uh, in your contract, and that's for submitting the backup documentation with your first RPR. So your first RPR with, with expenditures. So let's say July, you didn't have expenditures. August, you did have expenditures. You would need to submit the backup documentation um, with that RPR um, just for the first month. And again, this doesn't apply to um, everyone. It's, um, I think for the most part was a special term and condition um, included with uh, grants that were new to deed or new to support services. Um, so you can check your contract for that or, or or check with me if you have questions. I've been, as I've been reviewing RPRs, checking contracts and then um, following up if that's something that is needed. Um, and then our, oops, a couple more bullets there before I move on, but, um, and then our um, fiscal team reviews that uh, and just make sure everything looks in order and um, kind of does the financial reconciliation on that first RPR. And then we'll process that first one for payment. So the first one's a little bit unique um, in that there is that requirement for some grants, um, but for the most part, it's just submitting the RPR. Um, if your grant doesn't have the requirement, or even if your grant does have that special condition, after you've um, gone through it one month, it's just submitting the RPR form. Um, I would say uh, make sure to use the form submitted with this grant, especially for those of you who have other deed grants. They are the codes in there are specific to this. Um, this grant. Uh, and then, yeah, do submit it to the, um, I think maybe that's on the next slide, the email to submit it to. Maybe I didn't include that. Um, <clears throat> there's a general FSR email inbox that is listed on your RPR form. So submit it to that email. You can CC me um, as well, but uh, there's always a staff monitoring that um, general inbox uh, to process those um, as they as they come in. So that request um, for payment for reimbursement RPR should be submitted every month, whether there are expenditures or not. Um, particularly, I would say at this point, if you didn't have expenditures in July and August and you're submitting a September one, and I can tell from it that there's no previous expenditures, you don't need to go back and submit that July or August one. Um, this particularly comes up if you've been having expenditures and maybe there's nothing in January and I get a February one, uh, you know, did we miss January? That's sort of, um, uh, it's helpful to keep that cadence of submitting every month so that we're um, making sure nothing's missed, that we're tracking each month um, for for the grant. Um, do use, like I said, the, the form that was provided with your contract. If you do, um, if we do and do a contract modification, a couple of different examples have come up on when we might do that. The contract modification, um, if it includes a budget mod, would include a new um, RPR form, um, either with an end date uh, extended on the form or budget category changes. And then at that point, you would use the new RPR form, replace it, um, the old one with the new one. Um, and then key on the form, if, if you're the one filling it out um, or 
if someone else at your organization is filling out um, kind of for the separations of duty, there does need to be a separate person preparing the form and that person's name and signature and email need to be, it's kind of the top right, the left of the form. That needs to be a separate person than the person that is authorizing um, and signing off on the form. And that person who is an um, authorized signer, uh, their name and title and signature need to be there to the bottom left. So just making sure you have systems in place on your end that those are two different people. Um, that's one of the things we'll check. If something comes in that's uh, missing, it, it basically the RPR will get sent back to you to fix and you know just delays delays the processing a bit. So that's probably something that um, I see not necessarily a different person, but uh, the signature of the preparer, I would say, is the most common thing to be missed. Um, it's a little bit easier to miss because it's up in the upper left. <laughs> Expenditures um, need to be in the uh, in the cost category, may not exceed the approved budget for that category. Um, the approved budget amounts on the RPR um, can only be changed through a modification to the contract, like we talked about. Uh, the completed RPR must be submitted to the deed dot fsr at state dot mn dot us email account um, that so i did have the email in here just i was on the wrong slide earlier uh, and that uh they're due by the 20th of the month for the previous month so you know for example my example there is january rpr would be due february 20th and you don't have to wait until the 20th sometimes grantees are sending them in you know shortly after the end of the month um but we would like to get them all in by the by the 20th. And then just a few other things to check before you submit. Um, I know the common errors um, we'll see is check for that the sums, um, you know, everything adds up correctly. The Excel form is set up with the correct formulas, but sometimes if that gets deleted or or, or changed, you know, something won't sum correctly. Um, make sure things are reported in the correct budget categories. And then I would say that once you do have expenditures, I think it's column B is where you report your previous expenditures. So the easiest way to do that is look back at the previous month. What was the total expenditures um, to date uh, that was reported in that previous month? And then include that in column B, um, which would be your what's previously been um, reimbursed. The next column is what you're requesting for this current month and then the total um, it should be the sum of those two. So just kind of, um, again, if the formulas haven't been um, uh, altered, everything should total uh, correctly. But those are some of the kind of uh, little reasons that something will be returned and need to be corrected. And then there is a spot to mark final um, in the upper right. Just a checkbox, it's yes, no, if it's a final RPR or not. It would be um, just make sure to make no until that final one. And I guess uh, maybe a good point if you you we've talked about you can expend um, if you do if you request a uh, extension could expend beyond June, but you could also expend down funds sooner. So it's possible maybe your March RPR is your final. Um, you're fully expended. Mark it as final. Um, that way um, uh, <coughs> people know and can work on closing that that grant out. Let me pause there if there's any other questions related to kind of RPRs and the um, kind of the reimbursement procedure with these grants. If you've had if you've had other grants with um, Deeds ETP uh, division, it's a very similar process. So hopefully a a good reminder, um, and of course um, hopefully helpful for those of you who who are new. So Workforce One is the next section. Um, workforce One uh, is the web-based case management system for employment and training programs. Uh, and yeah, approximately 2,000 staff um, for working at cities, counties, nonprofits across the state use it to track services um, for many of the federally funded and state funded workforce programs. Um, and that uh, we use it for the support service program as well. Um, and there's the website for um, Workforce One. I imagine, um, yeah, if you've had grants before with support service, youth at work, other um, employment and training grants through DEED, 
you or probably someone on your staff is, is familiar with this system, but I um, wanted to give an overview for those that are new and um, go over to the um, couple uh, training options um, for those who want and need additional training. So in terms of zooming out about what um, kind of what you'll do with Workforce One um, is entering um, entering participants um, eligibility determination and enrollment information that you collect at program intake. Um, that should include the information that you'd be entering into Workforce One. Um, you'd be uh, then <clears throat> entering the information in Workforce One when that participant is new, and that's information that wouldn't need to be changed later unless there's you know, an address change, phone change, um, number change for that participant. Um, that's kind of their own participant profile. And then once you have them in the um, system, you would add activities uh, to represent the services you're providing to those participants on an ongoing basis. Um, and then closing those activities when you're done, um, entering um, case notes to capture kind of the activity of what you're doing with those participants kind of to tell that uh, ongoing story, having the record of you know what services are being provided um, to that participant, tracking outcomes, and then ultimately um, exiting those um, participants when the service is completed. So that's kind of the life cycle of, um, of participants um, uh, kind of tracking and um, through Workforce One. Um, that you that you'd have for for each of your participants. I'd imagine at this point, um, and I'll um, I think it's on the next slide. Yeah, talk a little bit more about the the back end um, of how we'll use Workforce One, and then specifically with support services, um, it's a custom program. I think maybe that's my next slide. But um, how we use it then is uh, on the admin side, we'll be able to. Uh, look and run reports for how many participants are enrolled, um, what services you're providing them, um, what activities they're enrolled in, um, what sort of out, what outcomes they're having, and then, um, you know, making sure that everyone's exited. So that's um, a kind of the, the same sort of process, but, not, but on the back end. Um, and that would be something, um, we have a quarterly report, which I'll, I'll uh, go over next, but is sort of a, a good checkpoint um, with the Workforce One. So the numbers submitted in the quarterly report should be backed up with what's been entered in Workforce One um, for, for that quarter. Uh, they'll be used to yeah, calculate um, that kind of final bullet organization outcomes. Um, and then it's also information that um, can be made available uh, to the legislature, other stakeholders. Um, it's kind of our data repository um, for um, like historic record as well on um, who you know who was served how many people were served well i always um you know the team write legislative reports progress reports legislative reports that provide a summary of the um outcomes and um activities for the grant but then workforce one would be the you know sort of the backup documentation for, for those reports So kind of um, nuts and bolts on the setup. Um, this is where I would, I mean, for transparency, we're not as far along as we've been in the past. The contracting process had a much later start this year um, coming out of session. So we're, like I said, my email just just wrapped up contracting end of last month um, for support service and, and still ongoing with our Youth at Work program. Uh, so the Workforce One custom program um, will be set up. It's not set up yet, but that will be set up in Workforce One. Um, and if you've had grants with other ETP programs in TEED, um, many of the other larger programs don't use custom program. There's a specific program that's been um, put into Workforce One for, for that program. Support services is small enough that um, we don't we don't have the funds to do that. So we use a custom program template, which um, does have its limitations, but um, will capture uh, the basic information needed. Um, and we're, like I said, working to get that set up for all state fiscal year 24, 25 um, support service grantees. Um, if you're, uh, so each of your organizations will need an account. 
if you've had an account in Workforce One, an organization account in Workforce One before, I'll be able to find that and basically give your organization account um, permission to the custom program for this grant. Um, if you are a new grantee to support services or a new grantee where you haven't had an organization account, that will need to be set up. And I have um, I, I have a list uh, of those grantees and can um, reach out individually. I think there's a couple additional steps that you'll need to take on your end to get that account set up. And then once set up, we can link um, that custom program to it. Um, even if your organization has had an account, um, you would need to make sure your staff that are going to be working with support service program have their own staff account and then that's linked to support service program. Um, once I have the custom program set up and linked to your organization account, I'll um I'll let you know and then I, I believe you can just link those staff accounts through a um a, a help ticket uh, in in workforce one, uh, you know, requesting that that staff have permission to that custom program. Um, if it's a staff that hasn't um, had a staff account before, that would need to get set up, and that's also can be done through a help ticket um, through on through Workforce One site. Yeah, and I, I'm hoping to get to that um, later this month and have everything set up and um, ready to go before that first quarterly report. Oh, and another question, it looks like from Stephanie. I've loved your other questions, so I'm sure another good one. <laughs> Hopefully I can answer. So uh, just a, a data question. So we do have a Workforce One account and a setup. We get money from Ramsey County, Iowa. Um, are we going to need to do dual entry of clients if they're enrolled in both programs? Or is there a way to kind of designate them as yeah, I, yeah, yeah, you probably get it what I'm trying to say. But how do we know if we have people who are co-enrolled, how do we know that? Uh, you'd be, you'd be, you would need to enroll them in the support service, but you should be able to link like their individual profile to, um, to the custom program and support service. So some of that information that doesn't change from program to program, their, you know, birthday, their name, all of that, can be linked to that custom program and then it would be marking then within the custom program like well what activities are they going to be provided through this program so kind of yeah i guess it wouldn't be creating that person profile from scratch but it would be um having them <clears throat> enrolled in this custom program so they show up as a participant for this program okay and then if if we're paying for certain services for that young person out of it, then we go in and mark that service in in the custom program versus in our YO program, for instance. Yes, like I guess I'm not sure I'm understanding the question correctly. If it's a participant, so the participants that would need to be in that custom program for support service would be participants that are being served under the program or, or that funds are being support service grant funds are being expended for that participant okay okay yep yeah and maybe reach out if, yeah because i don't know how many grantees will have like kind of that co-enrollment situation so yeah if there's maybe more nuanced question we can you can email me or, or we could yeah set up a call and just make sure that um that all makes sense, especially maybe once the system is set up and you had a chance to um, kind of navigate through and see if there's additional questions with that custom program. Great, thank you. And it looks like, oh, Shannon has a question, yes. Um, yeah, question with like enrolling, since the custom program's not set up in Workforce One, is it gonna be a similar thing of like the 90 day rule that we'll have to like fill in a help ticket to then like correct their enrollment date if we're past that 90 days of enrollment? Oh, I because I know we ran into with like another program of like Workforce One only lets you enroll after 90 days uh, and then like you can't go back farther. So will this be an instance of that? Like if we had participants start, start July in first. July? Um, oh, I suppose then, so. I feel like it's um, it would be 90 days, but that'd be the end of October. Yeah, potentially. OK, yeah, I am. Um, yeah, I think so. But let, let me check on that with our Workforce okay. One team. It's not, um, uh, 
yeah, I don't, I, yeah, I don't want to give any yeah. correct answer. No so I'm not 100 percent <laughs> sure on that one. Yep, sounds good. Thank you. Other um, other questions? I had a question. Yeah, because I've um, been sending them to um, Corey, and for this, the one that I'm working on right now, um, would I still send that to him, or do I send it to you? Um, this would be a workforce one question. Um, um, you would send, or this is more. I yeah, no, this is like the quarterly reports that we send out. So no, it's not specifically workforce one. So. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, yeah, it looks like. Oh, you're with um, is it Urban Roots? Yeah, for those no, of you who are... with Elpis. What was it? I'm with Elpis. Oh, okay. I see the wrong person highlighted here. Um, but I guess the for those of you, and it my apply it applies to several that have both a youth at work grant and a youth support service grant. Um, yeah, Corey would be um, the main point of contact for your youth at work grant. And um, then I'm the main point of contact for your support service grant. Um, I do support the work, youth at work program as well. Um, so I think those, I think the narrative quarterly reports are to come to me this year for youth at work. Um, but if it's a workforce one question for youth at work, that would, yeah, Corey would, um, be your, the best person to answer that. And I know he's similar position working to get everything set up in Workforce One for those grants. Okay, thank you. Uh, oh, it does look like, uh, oh, Haley. Uh, yeah, I just have one quick question related to Workforce One, because um, we are a youth at work and a youth support service um, grantee. And I know an issue that we ran into with Workforce One was around enrollment for youth um, who are in our program and we facilitate internships, but they are also like working with Right Track as well. So like Right Track were the ones that they were housed yeah. under Right Track and Workforce One. So we weren't able to. Has that changed this year now that we're receiving both? Like, do we still it's this weird like we're serving so many youth, but they're also in right track. So only one of us can um, how to speak in workforce one. So we're trying to figure out how we navigate that still. Within, and that's specific within your youth at work program or? or yeah, because yeah. we, because uh, City of St. Paul <laughs> right track also has a youth at work grant. And then, yeah, I think, um, yeah, that's, that's I think for that one, that still would be the same, although I, that, would be best to check with Corey where within youth at work grant, like only one grantee can like have that person listed in their program. Support service being a different funding stream, I believe you'd be able to report them as being um, a participant in your custom program on through support service grant. Okay, and if, um, and I just wanna double check, um, is City of St. Paul, Parks and Rec, uh, work, uh, right track, part of youth support services this time? No, no, they're okay. great. That, you, that right track program is yeah, youth at work program. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. And other questions? Let's see if I have another. I oh. have a question. It's related to the date. I'm, forgive me if you already answered this and maybe I missed it. Um, the 90 days, um, so it's starting from July 1st, so 90 days will be by the end of September. Is there going to be an adjustment of the date? Oh, you're right. I was off a month there. Mm -hmm. It's been three months already. Yeah, um, there must. Yeah, I'll check with our workforce one team to see because um, that would apply yeah, across the board. Um, I'm just thinking now. Uh, on that adjustment. That's a good question. Yeah, to see if they can do an adjustment um, on their end. I think I saw someone, a chat pop up. Let me see. <clears throat> or this is a question from the chat. Are we able to serve youth without them being enrolled in Workforce One? Sorry if I missed something. It just sounded like folks were going to enter enrollments. 
when the program is available, but the artists are really been holding off until the person was ready. So that would be um, that I think maybe kind of going to that 90 day uh, retroactive um, entering. So yeah, we'd expect that once workforce one is ready, you'd be entering the participants that um, you have or that have already been um, being served through the grant um, in, in the custom program. Kind of, it's a little bit of data catch up, I know, uh, on this end with the system. Um, but that, especially if you're able to do um, your intake process and then um, basically catch up with what uh, you're putting in um, Workforce One uh, custom program to kind of capture those services um, to those participants. But that's where I need to check on um, that date to see if we can get that, um, have uh, it go all the way back to July 1st, um, kind of across the board would uh, be what I would hope is able, is able to be done on the Workforce One end. Are there Workforce One questions? So some training resources, because I know for some of you, you're very familiar with Workforce One, others, this might be a brand new system. Um, training uh, is provided for Workforce One. There's a couple of different options. In the past, there's just been a, it used to be in person, and then with COVID got moved to virtual kind of case management training. Um, that is, uh, there's been very limited spots available for that. So we did have our Workforce One team record that training, um, and it's available in two parts um, in, on the work, on the Workforce One website. Uh, there's still an option, this is my third bullet, bullet there, to attend a live tra training. Um, I think last I looked, the most, the upcoming training was full. You can add yourself to the wait list, um, but when you're searching for that, it would be to search um, for training resources for employment and training um, program for the case management training. I know there's like several different trainings that Workforce One team does. It's the case management training and then either adding your signing up or adding your name to the wait list. Um, and I, I think that has been a, a bit of a bottleneck because so many grantees are seeking out that training around the same time. But I think that recorded training, uh, I'm glad that they have that resource available now because that um, hopefully can provide you you know that training uh, much quicker um, and then i think this is new this year um they, the workforce one team has just been putting these together i think in the last oh, over the course of the summer i saw um several of them become available um current videos um short recordings of specific topics and i think this will hopefully be something pretty um useful to our grantees um there's one on case notes one on activities and then plan topics with additional topics such as person search, application, and eligibility to come. So they're kind of building out this resource right now. Um, and those videos are, oh, I think they're like three to five minutes. They're much shorter than the full training, but kind of um, just focused on a specific topic. Um, and then those videos are available in uh, Workforce One under the resource um, tab under user how to guide. Uh, so this, um, uh, yeah, uh, oops, I was going to say, um, the videos would appear then at that top of that list if you can search by category. Um, I'll send an email out, I think, once we get the Workforce One set up with some of the direct links to, um, you know, this information and, and the trainings, because that is something um, that that has uh, uh, changed since years past. We used to just have that live training option available, and it really wasn't, um, wasn't sufficient uh, in terms of the uh, volume of people that could could attend. Um, the training itself is very um, comprehensive, but um, just not enough spaces in the in the in the classroom, basically. I think that's the last, yeah, last item on workforce one. Um, so reporting requirements is the last one. And I guess we are going um, closer to the hour, but um, we've had some great questions, which is uh, helpful to have throughout throughout the um, webinar today. So this, um, we mentioned a couple of times the quarterly report. Um, this is a quarterly progress report that um, provides both data and narrative on the um, on your grant. 
and those are due 30 days after the end of the calendar quarter. So your um, quarterly report template uh, would be the one that was provided with your executed contract. And then the first one would be due on the end of this month, October 30th, then and that would cover July, August and September. And then following from there, you know, January 30th, April 30th, July 30th. Um, if those fall on a weekend, just assume that next Monday um, for for those due dates. Uh, and that would be a report that should be cumulative. The data should be cumulative for the state fiscal year. And it's a, um, a word document that you would just email to me um, once once you have it complete. And there are three sections that group services, individual services and then narrative. So the group services, and I guess this kind of gets at one of the questions about entering participants in Workforce One. Participants that are served through group activities um, wouldn't be entered. These are kind of your non-case managed participants. This could be participants that are attending a career fair or you're doing a presentation, you know, in a high school classroom, something where you're not gathering that individual um, information on participants. You can report those sort of numbers served under that group activities, and that would be on that quarterly report. Um, and then you would just describe what those activities are in a short paragraph of what was provided that quarter. And this might not apply to your program. A lot of programs don't have the group services, and so you could just put NA for that section. The individual services would be for those participants that are receiving case managed services, the kind of one-on-one -on -one support um, that re numbers um, served should be cumulative for the state fiscal year and then align with that data in Workforce One. Um, and then the data section you'll see in the report, um, if you haven't taken a look already, would be demographic data, um, uh, other demographics related to sort of barriers to employment, um, program services, kind of what activities that they participate in that month, indicators of performance, what those outcomes were, and then customer satisfaction is captured through this quarterly report. I would say most grantees do this like once or twice a year, so it quite possible is you know, not something you're going to have data to report on in terms of customer satisfaction in the first quarter. Um, <clears throat> but by the end of the year, we would want to see by your final quarterly report, we'd want to have that um, customer satisfaction reported. And then the third section of the report is the narrative and that, um, yeah, as it as it sounds, is a short summary of activities and progress. There's, I think, about four question prompts around you know, progress on your work plan, challenges encountered, um, implementing the grant. There's a spot to highlight your program successes, um, which is where we capture success stories. Uh, and that would be, you know, individual stories of success um, that we've used in the past um, from um, when communications, our communications department wants to highlight some successes from our grant. I think it's a great way to um, kind of share those successes in a narrative form, um, paints a picture behind the numbers, I, I always think. Um, if you are submitting a success story that includes, you know, someone's name, um, specific identifying information, you would need to include um, a media release form with that story. And those are available in, I think, three or four languages now on our, our website. Um, and uh, that would be, again, for a sort of specific success story on an individual. Um, if you don't have one of those in that month, you know, a general success about the program, you could um, include something like that in your report. Uh, it's just kind of a, a, a space to uh, provide information on kind of progress that month um, and highlights, or that quarter, I should say. Um, so the data privacy and equal opportunity. Um, so grantees must inform program participants on how they're program and how their personal information will be used. Um, and there's a this is a form. I don't, I was just looking at it. I, it used to go out with our contracts and I don't believe it did. So I'll send this um, out to everyone so you all have the, the latest form. Um, but it's informing them then of their, you know, their rights, their EO rights, um, and then how they use their personal um, information. Um, and should be collected yeah, for each person that's getting those case managed services. And then finally, just because I know we're close on time, um, just go over some technical assistance. Um, we obviously is a welcome webinar, not really the end of the road on any sort of technical assistance. We want to be available to help answer questions on um, whether they're about, you know, your RPR, Workforce One, general overview for new staff. Um, if you do have a new staff person start, that's 
and a key staff person for your um, support service program, uh, you can uh, let me know. We could set up a call, kind of bring them up to speed on the program. Um, I'd probably provide them uh, some of the posted material as well from our website. We're working on updating the, the web page to uh, make sure it has all the latest information for this, this biennium. Um, so yeah, definitely reach out if you have questions, reach out to me. Um, if I don't know the answer, I'll um, loop in uh, my colleagues um, that can help answer the question. And then, um, oh, we already talked about the contract modification, which is great. That question came up at a perfectly timed uh, spot in the webinar. But yeah, if um, cost category revisions, extensions, um, and then I, the one I didn't mention is if the um, authorized signer changes um, at your organization, we'd want to get that information updated. Um, depending on when that happens, we might not need to do a contract modification. We would just include their name on the new contract, um, but definitely something to let us know because um, we'll track that on our contact sheet. And yeah, on my final slide, I wanted to leave with um, leave you all with the link to that uh, support service website that I referenced a couple of times. My email um, is listed there uh, for free to reach out uh, and just yeah, that we're just want to say yeah, we're looking forward to working with all of you throughout the throughout the coming year years, I should say, uh, the, the biennium. But I'll hold on here for um, additional questions. I definitely um, liked the questions that came in; they were really helpful, hopefully for everyone. Look like Stephanie has her hand up for another question. Yeah, but it's pretty specific, so I can wait until others get off if they want. Oh, so. okay. Yeah, I, I can hold on. I think the room will be available. I'll probably, yeah, maybe if we have some more general questions, we can hold on to those or uh, hang out here for those. And if not, um, yeah, if not, my email is there. Um, my phone is on my email signature. I should have put it in this website or in this um, webinar. Uh, like I said, I will post the recording of this webinar on our um, on our website. The RFP uh, is up there. The budget category definition, some of the forms I referenced um, are up there or we'll get the latest version posted up there so that um, it can be uh, available to you um, as needed. Thank you. Not sure, maybe that's a unmute. Well, I'm gonna end the recording and I guess officially kind of sign sign off um, from the webinar, but I'll hang out for uh, for sure. I think Stephanie, your question. If anyone else has a more specific question, we can cover it um, cover it here after I uh, end the recording, and the uh, the rest of you can um, uh, sign out as we're done with the official webinar. But thank you all for attending. Um, I'll stop the recording now. Thank you.